Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Morana Radman. I work at the Department of Health Psychology at University of Applied Health Sciences in Zagreb, Croatia. Um, this lecture, uh, How to Communicate Pain, was um, held at Advanced Train the Trainer Pain School in Ljubljana last winter. And this topic was part of the program because um, all chronic pain conditions must be viewed within a more comprehensive biopsychosocial framework that takes into account biomedical issues, but also includes how patients perceive their injuries, their disabilities, their pain, and how they make sense of what is happening to them. The words we use are crucial to this more comprehensive view since the words we use are at the same time our connection with and expression of the world around us. So the choice of the words we use is therefore crucial in the delivery of healthcare, where a misunderstood word can undermine treatment and create unnecessary stress. Only by paying careful attention to the words we use, by choosing words that are clear and concise, and uh, by understanding the principles of good communication, we can be assured that the message we intend is the message that is received. So we can all agree that pain is a universal human experience that affects people across cultures and languages. Um, this is why the International Association for the Study of Pain wanted to clarify and highlight important components of the pain experience. So they proposed new revised definition of pain that goes beyond nociception. Um, so the new definition that was launched in 2020 um, is and uh, is accepted now in its official definition that pain is an unpleasant unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling death associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So similar to the uh, previous uh, definition, the current one highlights the difference between pain and nociception, but also highlights the influence of life experiences on pain and the respect for person's verbal report on, of pain. So it better captures the personalized and biopsychosocial nature of pain, as well as recognition that pain can be expressed in behaviors that are nonverbal. So this is why I would like to emphasize that pain is always personal and conscious experience that's, that is influenced by biological, psychological, and social factors. And this notion reinforces the individual nature of pain and is a reminder that biopsychosocial factors influence the variability observed in pain. In other words, pain cannot be separated into a biological, psychological or social component, but rather pain always encompasses biological, psychological and social components. Um, so this is why through their life experiences, Individuals learn the concept of pain. And um, this note is a cue for uh, physiotherapists and rehabilitation scientists to fully consider how prior life experiences may impact the current pain experience. It's also a call to better integrate prior life experiences into care, research, and education. So physiotherapists should embrace this concept because pain is a learned concept then strategies beyond just providing pain relief can be used to manage pain. Now, um, at the beginning of this slide, there is a small uh, task for you. Uh, think and rank the following, following words according to the intensity of pain that they convey, from less intense to more intense. Uh, words are pain, ache, and hurt. Okay, um, this example was taken from a very old study from, uh, of Gaston and Johansson in 1984. Uh, study was called pain assessment, differences in quality and intensity of the words pain, ache and hurt. 
So study was undertaken to investigate if the concepts of pain, ache and hurt differ from each other in intensity and quality and was set to identify discriminating semantic correlates for each of these concepts. 41 nurses with different backgrounds in nursing and 12 patients with chronic pain syndrome were included in the study. So uh, I'm gonna show you results and the study showed actually uh, a statistically significant difference in the intensity of the words pain, ache and hurt on both visual analog scale and melzak mcgill pain questionnaire. So uh, pain was shown to have the highest intensity followed by a ache and uh, with hurt having the lowest intensity on visual analog scale. So what were the, the correlates of every single word? This is what I'm going to sh this is what I'm going to show you now. Um, so here you can see the correlates, semantic correlates for word pain. And I'm going to read them now out loud. And while I'm reading them, I would like you to reflect on um, the, what type of pain do they express? Is it sensoric experience or is it emotional experience? Plus, I would like you to reflect on the intensity that you feel that this word conveys. And this is a, a, a task for you for all three previously mentioned words, pain, ache and hurt. And it's a good intro in uh, the, the, in the something that I'm going to show you a couple of slides later, uh, which is called psycholinguistic or the uh, uh, psycholinguistics of pain, or uh, it, it, it sounds better when we talk about architecture of pain language. So reflect, is it sensoric experience or uh, emotional experience, and which is the intensity of each word? So semantic correlates for pain are cutting, crushing, tearing, sharp, dreadful, killing, suffocating, torturing. To continue with semantic correlates for ache, think and reflect sensoric experience or emotional and which is the intensity of each word. Aching, pulling, knowing, irritating, annoying, troublesome, exhausting, unbearable, terrifying. And last but not the least, word hurt. Semantic cor correlates for hurt are pricking, pinching, stinging, sore, fearful, unhappy. So uh, we can see that the intensity in which these words are perceived as painful is very different. And you can uh, feel that they convey different different intensities okay so this is this task was just an intro for um neuroscientific research on language and pain so words are neurological events they are meaning laden puffs of air that our brain transforms into knowledge, opinions, emotions, or danger signals. Um, Shakespeare, perhaps the greatest wordsmith of all time, frequently used bodily sensations, including sensitivity to pain, as metaphors. So if you ever complained about the bitter cold, um, called an ugly sight an eyesore, uh, or fe felt it sharper than a serpent's tooth, to have a taintless child, you might know what I mean by saying this. Um, in the, if we talk about medical context, the right words in medical context can activate both, both the pain-busting endogenous opioid networks in the brain and feel-good dopamine-driven reward centers. 
one of the most widely relied upon pain assessment questionnaires, the McGill Pain Questionnaire, relies entirely on verbal descriptions of pain to diagnose the severity of someone's pain. So um, given how important language can be to pain sufferers, well-trained clinicians go to some lengths to use appropriate terms. So we can spot patients at high risk of disability by carefully listening to how they tell us about their pain, pain predicament. So in everyday and clinical contexts, uh, it is common for a person to most often verbally, verbally express his pain. Of course, this is not the only way. There are also facial expressions, behaviors, and uh, physiological processes that express the experience of pain. However, uh, verbal expression is one of the most dominant. Since pain is declared the fifth vital sign, along with body temperature, pulse, respiration, and blood pressure, Many clinicians routinely ask patients about their pain, and pa patients, in return, extract terms from their, their lexicon of pain to denote the sensory and affective qualities of their pain. Thus, um, language is a very important um, component of expressing pain, but also of interpreting the experience itself. In this perspective, where emotional, cognitive, and social factors in, um, in the origin and interp interpretation of pain experiences are emphasized, um, there is a valid question posed. Are the current clinical measurement in instruments sufficient to measure pain? Are um, aspects of psychological and social pain, not just physical pain, taken into account? Can people verbally express the subjective experience? If so, in what way? So, as has, as has been said, we most often verbally describe a painful experience. However, some, uh, some uh, neuroscientific studies have shown exactly the opposite, that words can hurt. So, how does language processing of words related to pain affect the experience of pain? Pain-related uh, word processing has been found to be associated with enhanced activation of areas of the brain involved in pain processing and modulates the perception um, of har harmful stimuli. So one of the first systematic research of, in this field was done in the Italian language by Borelli and colleagues, and it suggested that semantic content of pain-related language differentiates its psycholinguistic and emotional structure from general language, especially from emotionally negative language. So it's a, let's say, a lexicon uh, with his, its, its own, um, with, with its own structure specifically pain, let's say pain, uh, pain related language or pain lexicon. So the same uh, group of researchers wanted to find out, um, they wanted to find out uh, does the semantic and affective meaning of the words affected to pain or does the pain lexicon uh, of the pain lexicon in cancer patients or chronic pain patients, and that they, then they took uh, cancer patients as a group of chronic pain patients. Um, does it differ uh, in chronic uh, pain patients and healthy population? And um, this study was done uh, in Italy, also in Italian language, and, uh, um, and uh, chronic pain patients, the cancer patients put on early palliative care actually rated pain words as less negative, less pain related, and conveying, uh, conveying a lower intensity and unpleasantness than controls. So this uh, exploratory study suggested that a chronic pain experience, as the one experienced by cancer patients on early palliative care, 
affects the semantic and affective representation of pain words. Roughly, re really roughly said, um, this means that maybe uh, chronic pain patients, at least one uh, cancer patients on early palliative care, um, they get used to living with chronic pain. They kind of take it as a part of their lives. Uh, I think we all know the proverb, sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words will never hurt me. Uh, current uh, neuroscientific research says that that's not true. That's not true. Words can hurt and will hurt you. So um, knowing this, uh, clinically, physiotherapists um, need to embrace key themes from current research on language and pain to provide progressive treatment for individ with individ individuals with acute and chronic pain. Um, for example, one way to validate an individual's experience is to accept the report of pain instead of challenging it or questioning it. Uh, assessment of pain should mirror the biopsychosocial model by incorporating the impact of pain on the person in terms of function, psychological and social contexts. Um, therefore, um, the clinician should be able to deliver multiple behavioral and verbal strategies that promote activity and self-management to shape this learned experience in such way that it helps the individual to better manage their pain. And what do we mean by this? Uh, will be presented on the next slide. Um, words are important. Um, the language we use and the stories we tell have great significance to all involved. They carry a sense of hope and possibility or can be associated with a sense of pessimism and low expectations, uh, both of which can influence personal outcomes. Um, the difficulty in talking about painful sensations forces people to draw on metaphors, analogies, and metonyms when attempting to communicate, communicate their pain to others. So it's important to recognize um, that the words we use in speech and in writing can influence others' mood, self-esteem, and feelings of happiness or depression. Um, and a uh, Causal misuse of words or the use of words with negative connotations when talking about chronic pain in everyday conversations can have a profound impact on the person with chronic pain. So on this slide, um, I, I drew out some typical words to avoid and alternatives you can use for patients. For example, in, in some kind of regular physiotherapy, you can use often a term chronic degenerative changes. And that sounds very pessimistic, heavy, uh, that something is wrong uh, only with you and not others. But if you rephrase this as normal age changes, then you know that it's something that is expected at certain age or period of life. Um, also, uh, if you use words wear and tear, that would be, let's say, um, uh, also very heavy, very uh, frightening. Um, or um, you can use also uh, uh, a previously mentioned term, it's an it's an age change. It's a normal age change. Uh, and um, uh, for example, what we often do is when we try to console our patients or motivate them, we say, don't worry. Um, but these phrases aren't, um, aren't heard uh, as they supposed to be heard. So some kind of alternative would be okay everything will be okay. Um, if you use often word damage, maybe it's a better alternative to say it's a repairable harm, etc., etc. So it's, um, it's um, how you phrase your sentences 
which words you use will actually uh, activate different feelings and different brain processing uh, in the patient's mind. And we want to have a, a patient who is motivated and um, not frightened and uh, who understands its condition and who can try and um, be an active participant in his own pain management program. Yeah. Uh, here is another. Here is another example of, um, let's say, negative talk. Um, if you catch your patients talking about their chronic pain or their functional ability due to chronic pain, about, oh, it's ridiculous that I can't do this. I've always been able to do it. Um, the resulting emotion caused by this language are frustration, shame, resentment. So anyone doing something ridiculous must be deserving uh, of ridicule, which means the pain is making you into a figure worthy of contempt and embarrassment. So now imagine you catch your patients talking like this and teach them how to replace or rephrase this thought with something different like it's annoying i can't do things like i used to i'm working on getting better but i'm not there yet um, this may equally be as factual as the first thought but the tone is much much less contemptuous and the resulting emotions are more likely to encourage resilience than low morale so the thought may be father to the deed but words are mother to the thought so this insight forms the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy which has been significant in helping people living in persistent persistent pain um, at the end i would like to say that a critical task in pain psychology is to help people how to learn to rephrase their inner monologue so it becomes more realistic and supportive. Um, because being able to catch and recognize unhelpful or unrealistic impulses, um, although it's not easy, but it's the skill uh, and the basis of many successful adaptations to persistent pain. And you as physiotherapist can be uh, very he helpful in this um, so I would advise you to listen carefully to the language that surrounds people with pain. Listen to how you talk about them. Are you increasing their disability by using well-intentioned pain cliches? Um, it's because uh, a better life for your patients may be just uh, a few helpful, helpful phrases away. Uh, at the end, I would like to leave you with the notion that I've opened presentation with, just to uh, let it sink in, because I think it's very valuable. Um, be aware that only by paying careful attention to the words we use, by choosing words that are clear, concise, and by understanding the principles of good communication, we can be assured that the message we intend is the message that is received. Thank you very much uh, for your attention.